when you think of jumping into politics anytime in Africa, uh, people start asking questions. Uh, what are you bringing? Why do you think you're the right person at this time to be governor of a state? Uh, well, actually, the first question you're asked is, are you crazy? <laughs> are you really, really out of your mind? Why are you doing this? And that's what I get asked first, most of all, because they know from the trajectory which I have had in business that there's quite a bit you're bringing. <clears throat> if you've succeeded in business in Africa, first and foremost, it's a very challenging place for you to succeed. And if you can succeed, I've always said this, if you can succeed as a businessman in Africa, you can succeed anywhere in the world. And then you bring that into politics and into governance, then you are actually bringing something valuable. I found out maybe three things came straight to the top. The first aspect of it is this whole fact that there's a mindset that you must absolutely separate business from politics, clear. When we do international business, one of the things we are told first and foremost is that if you do anything with politics, then you will be labeled as a politically exposed person. What that does, first and foremost, is that anyone who can make a difference in politics in Africa stays away from it first. Why? Because politically exposed persons find it extremely difficult to do anything. If you're going to have a business, you're in trouble. If you're going to travel, you're profiled. The second thing is that there's nothing like a vacuum in life. <clears throat> if you take the best out of the picture, then what you're going to get is that you're going to get the rest. You're just going to get anyone else come into politics. The third thing that I found very, very difficult is that we tend to export, migrate our best. And so the best of the African brains, are they go abroad, they go to America, Canada, wherever is going to accept them. And what you leave behind is not often the best. And these three things become a problem. And it becomes a problem for us to challenge how we begin to make the potential yeah. come to pass. I mean, what is the reason behind that? Why is it that political parties do not look for the very best to represent uh, their people? Because we know that running a country uh, is perhaps the most uh, um, intricate thing anybody can do. Unfortunately, I would put this down to what you would call, who, who do you hold accountable? At the end of the day, the voters hold accountable the people who have come out of the process, not the people who make the process happen. And I, th I think this is really where we be must begin to shift focus. If you hold those who are making the selection process, the shortlisting, hold them responsible. And you have to be a part of that process. A lot of times we wait until it is far too late for us. Now, the few people who sit down and make a selection of an election or determining who, 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 and who will come out, those few people have to be held accountable for something. Mm -hmm. Who is holding them accountable? And that's really where the question is. Would you say, perhaps, uh, to some degree also, that the culture, our culture, uh, really undermines that process? Because first, the political systems are insular, and uh, then we are so beholden to power and authority, to our chiefs, to our kings, you know, we don't question. We, you know, we, you do what you're told. <laughs> I love that. And so here, this is where we have what you would call the theory of change. When we take a look at the process of democracy, as a big word democracy, right? People think that they know what democracy is until you begin to break it down individually. And when I ask individually, what does democracy mean to you? you find out that it actually means something slightly different from what it means to me. Countries that have gotten this right have taken their culture, so whether it's the kings and chiefs and all that we have as our tradition, we understand that, but then we must translate that into what democracy is. And when we then bring that culture that we have and we wrap it around the democracy that we want to have, then it becomes better. What we unfortunately have done in Africa, unfortunate, is that we're running parallel systems. We're running a system we understand, which is our cultural system, we respect our kings, our chiefs, and all of that. And we're running a system that is important, which is the democracy, whether it's a Western democracy. So we're running two systems that are contrary to each other. The chief says, vote for X. That's all he needs. He goes and votes for X. 
But then there's a system that is democratic, which basically says that you must interrogate everything and the people must choose who represents them the best. But the people haven't chosen. In some places, actually, politics is a dirty word. Mm. And they are, what makes it? What is politics? Interesting. That's like, yes, we what's democracy? <laughs> <clears throat> but you know, incidentally, the first time that I determined that I was going to go into politics and I made that decision and I left, I was actually coming to the US. I came in and I just realized that I didn't have any cards because I couldn't carry the complimentary card that I had before and I was coming for the United Nations uh, General Assembly at the time. And so I called a couple of young mentees that I had and I said, look, I need to make a card. I need to make a new card. And they were like, but I'm having a challenge. And they said, what's the challenge? I said, what do I call myself? And I said, okay, so Tony Cole. And I said, politician. And I was like, no, don't. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't. Yeah. I said, no. But we have to be true about this. Yeah. If we're coming in to make a change, why are you so angry? Why are you so against this word politician? And they, each and every one of them said it connotes a very dirty game. And so the minute you label yourself as a politician, you have a problem. Now, this was food for thought for me because here I have been in a business, I'd built myself for years up until a point of respectability. Yeah. And now I was coming into another business and the first thing that I was going to do was give myself a title that was going to bring me down into the, into the mud. So the second, why is it so dirty? An old man said to me, we make politics look dirtier than it is because you and your kind don't want your whites to get stained. That as long as it's that way, you are never going to be serious and we are afraid of you. Yeah. And that was fundamental. Um, my observation over the years is that actually politics changes a person. A uh, well-intentioned person goes into politics and uh, it turns into something else. And I have personally seen it. I've seen it People too. People that I've known, friends of mine. I've seen it too. So what makes you think politics will leave you intact? So, so, that, so first of all, you must have a very sound spiritual core. Very, very sound. You must know yourself internally as to who you are. Because that aspect of you, the day you lose who you are, you're lost in politics. But the second aspect of it is also understanding what, when I went to Oxford um, last year, I came across a, a term which is called the coalition of the unlikely. Now the coalition of the unlikely came about with a professor of mine called Ramana, <coughs> Kathy Ramana, who talked about this and said, you know, in politics, who you call the elite is different. Everybody is, important. And I saw what happened in India with Gandhi, and he set up this whole thing called the ashram. And I borrowed from that. And I realized that if we're ever going to make any difference and not lose ourselves, we must be able to respect the different forces that come along in politics. I think where people lose themselves is that you choose to either not respect them, you choose to align with one who you think is the strongest and you sell your soul to the devil there. It shouldn't happen. People come from the private sector and one of the things they can put out there as a selling point is that you, if I get into government, I'm your governor, I'm your president, I'll be able to run the country better than perhaps my predecessors. Uh, how genuine is that? There is a rule that is played when you have been successful at doing something, especially when you've been successful at building businesses. And where does this come from? The first aspect of it is every day you wake up as an entrepreneur, every day you wake up, you know that if you do not make a dollar turn into a dollar 20, then people are going to get hungry. You have salaries to pay. There are people who depend on you to make sure that you make a success. And running a country is almost the same. There are people who depend on you, on the policies that you make, for them to survive the next day and the day after. But I used to talk about long-term plans then. We must be able to realize this different things that a man who has not eaten today 
talk to him about his plans for next week. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work. And some will tell you that all these millions of people who are sleeping hungry actually need not sleep hungry. There's so much of food uh, across the continent. There's so much wealth. But the big elephant the in big the room sea. is corruption. The big C. So how do you deal with that? This is uh, almost like a, an age-old problem which keeps the continent of Africa down. So I used to be part of the World Economic Forum. And in the World Economic Forum, there's a group called Partnering Against Corruption Initiative, Pachi. And one of the big things that I realized, first, to get as a Nigerian company in the oil and gas business in Africa meant that everything around my story had to first deal with corruption. It was always there. Once I walked into a room, first, you must be corrupt. Why? Oh, you're Nigerian. Oh, really? <laughs> But what's the point here? In getting into Pache, so we're sitting down with global companies that have dealt with corruption in different countries. And so with Pache, it was about, can we really solve the problem of corruption? And that's what I loved about it. And the answer was this. The war against drugs has not been won because it's a war against drugs. Like the war against corruption. You don't win it because it's a war against corruption. What did Pachi do? Pachi decided that rather than fight this war, design corruption out of his system. Chile decided that they were going to design corruption out of the custom system by one, shining light on the system, making it a lot more transparent, reducing the number of taxes, import taxes that you have to do, making it public, and then they remove the system of cash and you pay directly. Guess what? Corruption died in the custom system overnight. That caught my attention. And I began to know that if we're really going to deal with corruption, then what we need to do is look at the system. Where are the hurdles? And you design the hurdles out of it. Mm -hmm. Finally, and this issue of corruption, I often see that when I meet with God, when, when I was still on the other side and I met with government officials who create policies, I say to them, I say, you know, if you really want to design corruption out of a system, sit down with the business people. So we know where the hurdles are. Yeah. Let's sit down and design corruption out of those hurdles. Is it Tony who is going to make Nigeria or your state really function corruption free, have good governance, or should the priority in any country, any state, be, be on changing the institutions to hold leaders accountable, uh, changing the culture, uh, the mindset of the people, so that it does not matter who occupies that position, but the system will compel you to govern in, within certain acceptable norms, and of course, hopefully, to be free of corruption because the law will catch up with you. You answered the question beautifully. I think if I capture exactly what you said, play it back, take it back to Nigeria, we've made it work. But more seriously, they both, they're, none is exclusive of the other. Each has to work with the other. The first aspect of it is that you must have a leader who's willing to pay the price. And that's where I come in. I am willing to pay that price. But the second is that you must understand that there's a system that you're dealing with. And that system in itself has to be worked on. And you must be able to make sure that there are consequences within that system to do it. The end result is that you must have no idea who you're in Nigeria, it's called your local government chairman is for you to do business. You don't need to know a politician for you to survive. It's not necessary. The system should be able to make sure that whatever you decide to do, you should be able to survive doing it. And that's where we need to get to. But it's a process. It's a journey. It doesn't happen overnight. Can I do it on my own? No. Can I do it with the help of people? Absolutely. Are there people inside the system who are tired of what they're seeing inside the system that are ready to join hands with me to make that happen? Yes. The issue is that they need to see the courage from the leader who is ready to make those changes. And then they know that it's a sacrifice that if they can join you to make that happen, then they will benefit 
in the long run for with their children not having to beg for bread.